Welcome to another WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest network and information security stories each week. I'm Corey, your host, and this is the episode for the week starting June 11th, 2012. Before I start, you might notice the lack of our floating monitor this week. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, I didn't have the extra production time to edit it in. But don't worry, it will come back next week. And of course, if you check out the WatchGuard Security Center blog where I post this video, I'll be sure to include a reference section that has a lot of the details I sometimes put in the Magic Monitor. So being the second week of the month, the theme was software updates. As you probably know by now, Microsoft puts their patch day on the second Tuesday of every month. But of course, since then, other software vendors have decided to make the second week of the month their patch days as well. Some of them share Microsoft Tuesday, while others just sprinkle their patch throughout the week. So most of this episode's stories have to do with software updates. Let's start with the big one, which is of course Microsoft Patch Day. If you followed our blog, you know that Microsoft released seven security bulletins, very similar to last month. This month's seven updates fixed 27 security flaws in products including Internet Explorer, uh, Windows, a program called Microsoft Link, which is the new version of Communicator, and another uh, enterprise program Microsoft calls Dynamics AX Enterprise Portal. There are really two really big bulletins you really should know about, as well as one other kind of secret Microsoft advisory you may not know about. Uh, starting with the bulletins, the biggest one was probably the Internet Explorer cumulative patch. This patch fixed a whole bunch of vulnerabilities in Internet Explorer, including many that attackers could leverage for drive-by download attacks. This included some vulnerabilities that uh, researchers showed way back in the Pwn to Own contest. The second big bulletin was yet another software update to Microsoft's remote desktop protocol component. If you remember way back in March, there was a pretty significant vulnerability in the remote desktop protocol, the protocol we use to uh, control our desktop over the network. Basically, there's yet another remote code execution vulnerability in the remote desktop protocol. Uh, the remote desktop protocol is a very attractive target to attackers. A lot of people expose this service externally so that they can manage their computers remotely. So a lot of attackers know that if they scan on certain ports, they might find remote desktops. So if you have it patched, they could exploit this to gain access to your computer and full control of it. So if you do use remote desktop protocol or any of the other uh, Windows features, such as their support feature that use remote desktop protocol, and of course, terminal servers, be sure to apply this patch. The final really big Microsoft story was during patch day, they also released a security advisory. Unlike security bulletins where they have an update, a security advisory is when they've learned of some sort of vulnerability in the wild, which they may not have a patch for. And that's just what happened this week. Uh, during patch day, they released a security advisory talking about a zero day vulnerability in their XML core services. Now the XML core services is a component that ships with Microsoft products to help them use XML web content. Uh, if you have Windows, you probably have the XML core services. Maybe you installed the .NET framework and it came with that. Uh, certain versions of Windows come with it. Uh, in any case, most Windows users have this XML core service component on their machine. Now over the last few weeks, Microsoft has learned that attackers have been exploiting a previously undisclosed flaw in XML core services uh, to do drive-by downloads in the wild. Since they just learned of this flaw based on these wild attacks, they haven't had time to patch it yet. However, this security advisory points a link to what they call a fix it, which is a quick fix that should mitigate this vulnerability and prevent this particular attack working. So if you're a Windows user, you should also check out the security advisory I put in the reference section and get that particular fix it. 
So that covers Microsoft's updates. But this week, that was just the tip of the iceberg for software updates. Adobe is one of the vendors that actually shares Microsoft Patch Tuesday, and they often release their updates on the second Tuesday of the month as well. Luckily, this month was a very light day for Adobe. The only new update they released was a security bulletin for their Cold Fusion product. This is their web application server. Uh, basically, the Cold Fusion update fixes a couple vulnerabilities, some of them serious in Cold Fusion. So if you are a Cold Fusion user, be sure to go to Adobe's security page and get that update. More importantly, shortly after patch day, Oracle released a big Java update. Java, of course, is a very popular package that almost everyone installs to help support uh, uh, multimedia dynamic web applications. Uh, this week, Oracle released a big update that fixed 14 security vulnerabilities in the Java application. Now, about 12 of these vulnerabilities were remote code execution vulnerabilities. So again, perfect vulnerabilities for attackers to leverage for drive-by download attacks, which is where they get you to come to some site with a browser that has Java and they leverage the vulnerabilities to run code on your computer. So if you use Java, which most people do, you should definitely go get this Java patch, especially because right now Java is actually the most targeted piece of software on Windows PC computers. In fact, nowadays attackers are more often targeting Java vulnerabilities than vulnerabilities in your actual browser like IE or Firefox. So Java is a very, very important package to update. Now speaking of Java, Apple's OS X also uses Java. In fact, OS X ships with a version of Java built in. If you remember back about a month ago, we were talking about a Mac botnet. Uh, this was a, a piece of malware that infected Mac computers and created a relatively big botnet. And the way it got on computers was uh, leveraging a vulnerability in Java. Now back then, you might remember that a lot of security professionals were kind of upset with Apple because Java had actually fixed the vulnerability uh, that OS X suffered from months before Apple had actually patched it. So Apple was very, very behind on their Java updates. But that changed this week. During this week, Apple actually released their Java update for OS X, both Lion and Snow Leopard, on the exact same day as Oracle released their Java update. So it does look like Apple's listening and, and learning about security and maybe adjusting their packages. Uh, not related to software updates, but kind of on this same vein, another interesting thing that happened this week was Apple actually subtly updated some of their marketing pages. They had a few pages which a lot of security experts didn't like, where they talked about how Macs do not suffer from PC malware. And it, it kind of made it seem like they were bulletproof to viruses, unlike Windows computers. Well, this week, without a lot of fanfare, uh, Apple made some changes to those pages. They still say that OS X is built for, for security and safety, but they've removed some of the verbiage that makes it seem like they're absolutely immune to attack. So this really does suggest that Apple might be changing their tune about how they handle security issues, which is really good for the community. So let's just continue on with a few more software vulnerabilities and the updates to fix them. Next up is VMware. This week, VMware did also release a security advisory. Uh, the advisory was for all of their hypervisor products. I believe uh, their VMware Player, VMware Fusion, which is the Mac version of their popular virtualization software, uh, VMware Workstation, and of course, VMware ESX and ESXi. Anyways, this week's security advisory uh, was put out to fix two security vulnerabilities. The worst was probably a memory corruption vulnerability that allowed the guest system to execute code on the local host. This vulnerability is essentially caused by a flaw in the way uh, VMware handles specially crafted checkpoint files. If an attacker that has access to one of the VMware guest systems is able to run a maliciously crafted uh, checkpoint file, he's able to run code on the actual local host system which is pretty dangerous. So long story short, if you use any VMware products, you probably want to go get this security update. While we're talking about virtualization, there's also another interesting virtualization-related vulnerability put out this week by US CERT. Uh, this issue has to do with 
uh, products that are using a 64-bit Intel processor, a 64-bit operating system, and virtualization. Without getting into nitty-gritty technical details, basically if you're using an Intel processor and a 64-bit operating system on cer certain virtualization hypervisor platforms, they suffer from this privilege escalation vulnerability that an attacker might leverage to get the guest system to gain access to the host itself. It's a very complex vulnerability that happens at a low level having to do with ring 3 versus ring 0 execution. If you're interested, check out the reference section uh, where I put the US CERT bulletin. But long story short, if you do have any 64-bit Intel processors running hypervisors, you're going to want to look into this particular bulletin. Now the good news, I was just talking about VMware. VMware is one of the only hypervisors not affected by this particular issue. However, if you're running uh, Microsoft's virtualization products, Citrix Zen, or many other virtualization products on a 64-bit Intel processor, you may be vulnerable to this particular flaw. So be sure to check out the US CERT bulletin to figure out what vendors are affected and what patches you might have to install. So those software updates were really the biggest stories and themes from this week, but there are a few little outliers there I'd like to share quickly. Uh, one is I'll give you yet another Flame update. Again, Flame is that advanced persistent threat or, or, or cyber espionage malware we've been mentioning in the past few episodes. There have been more updates on Flame. Uh, the most interesting update is this week Kaspersky released some research stating that they believe Flame is strongly tied to Stuxnet. It comes from probably the same authors. Before this, Kaspersky hadn't really found any similar code in Flame as was in Stuxnet. Uh, you might remember Dooku, which was a piece of malware that shared a lot of same source code as Stuxnet. But they hadn't yet found any uh, shared source code in Flame. However, this week they found a module, I believe they call it Resource 207. It was a module that had to do with how uh, Flame was able to spread using USB keys and share data using USB keys. And this particular module did have shared code that was also found in Stuxnet. So according to Kaspersky, they strongly believe while Flame is a different piece of malware that was created for a slightly different purpose than Stuxnet, it probably comes from a another team that's related to the Stuxnet team. Another little cloak and dagger tidbit about Flame is ever since uh, Kaspersky has found it, uh, the authors of Flame have actually purposely been starting to delete Flame from infected machines. So this really suggests that Flame's authors want to get it off systems so researchers and analysts can't further look at it, which again points to it being a really, really advanced attacker, a nation state, and again, everyone pretty much suspects it probably the US. So the last quick story I want to share with you is beware of Father's Day related malware campaigns. This week some researchers disclosed that they've seen some email phishing campaigns using Father's Day uh, to try to entice victims to, to install something bad or to visit a malicious site. Uh, as you probably know, attackers are really, really good at paying attention to big events, whether they be holidays or natural disasters or big pop culture events, to use as kind of a social engineering lure to get you to install an attachment or to go to a link. And since Father's Day is coming up this Sunday, uh, a lot of malware authors are using Father's Day to try to get people to follow those links. So if you're a dad out there and you're going through email that might have some sort of Father's Day theme, hopefully it's just a cute message from your kids, but if it has a link or an attachment, you might want to think about it before you click on it. Well, that's it for this week's software update themed episode. I'll be back next week with more security news and I'll be sure to bring back my floating monitor. As usual, if you'd like more regular security related news, be sure to check out our WatchGuard Security Center blog. You can also check me out on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept. Thanks for watching, and at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.